stuff. Good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our Spokes Public Summer Public Meeting on City Centre Transformation. Um, many thanks to the Spokes team who's organised the meeting. There's at least 10 people involved, but particular thanks to Martin McDonnell, who's the overall organiser. Um, thank you to Augustine United for the premises and looking after us. If anyone is tweeting about the meeting, and I'm sure lots of people are, the hashtag is SpokesMTG. Um, the meeting is also being live broadcast on YouTube, as Martin mentioned earlier. Thank you also very much to the Festival of Cycling, um, which is a hugely impressive event now. Um, and Kim, who is the organizer, asked me specifically to mention the event on the 22nd, which is Copenhagen Eyes which is a guy who's been very involved in the developments in Copenhagen, talking about that. Should be a really good evening. 
Um, the Festival of Cycling is working with Edinburgh Napier University on a research project into the festival and how it ties in with Edinburgh Council's ambitions on active travel. Um, and there's information, there's information about that um, which you, you're going to be handed, I think, on your way out by someone called Connie, I believe. Is that right? Could Connie put up her hand? Um, okay, I'm not sure if she's here, but anyway, I believe you'll be handed that, so please fill in the online questionnaire when you get, when you get home about that. Um, now, it's always great when we get politicians turning up even though they haven't been invited and they've just come to sit and listen. And <laughs> it's fantastic tonight. We've got a real, um, real humdinger, if that's the right word. Um, we've got the transport convener from Glasgow City Council, Councillor Anna Richardson. So just put up your hand, Anna, if you will. <laughs> um, so if you want to chat to councillors at the end, we've also got Councillor Chaz Booth, who's the green transport spokesperson. A bit higher, Chaz. <laughs> Are there any other politicians here tonight? <laughs> no. Well, we, us we usually have two or three, so that's great. Um, Right, in Edinburgh, there's a, a growing and strong recognition that the city centre has been falling behind comparable European cities or comparable European capitals in terms of traffic reduction and making the city centre a more attractive place for, for people. When Edinburgh introduced the tram, they had the opportunity to reduce traffic at the same time, but that opportunity was not taken. Roughly 10 years ago, we had the Gale Report, which calls George Street a car park and Printed Street a bus station. Well, that report is still lying on the electronic shelf. George Street, for the last 10 years, has been in a state of permanent consultation. Piketty Place, that's going to be certainly improved as far as cycling is concerned. But again, the opportunity was not taken to introduce traffic reduction measures and it's going to remain as a gyratory. So in terms of cycling in Edinburgh, um, in the city centre, the last few years have seen bike racks introduced, but that's, that's just about all. Although the council has a big cycle budget, it's nearly all been invested in edge of city routes, which are obviously useful, but they're the easy ones to do politically because they don't involve taking space away from motorists. We've not really seen anything happening in the city centre. Um, and all these factors I've mentioned have led to... Well, I, sh I should also say that um, perhaps as a result of that, as you'll have seen from the lead article in the Spokes Bulletin, our own traffic counts suggest that the long-term increase in cycle use in the city centre and the long-term parallel decline in car use in the city centre in the rush hours, both of these trends appear to be leveling off now. So all these factors are leading to the need for a city centre transformation. And what we need is not just a new vision, but we need action to implement that vision as well. And I'm hoping we might hear some early hints tonight, but that'll be up to Daisy. Um, Glasgow, there's always been friendly rivalry between Edinburgh and Glasgow in all areas of policy. So it's no surprise that when Edinburgh has a transformation um, project, Glasgow has a connectivity commission. <laughs> now, I'm not sure which came first. <laughs> we may be enlightened on that. Um, but in terms of cycling rivalry between the two cities, many years ago, both cities had the same very, very low levels of cycle commuting, around 1% of all trips. But over a good number of years, indeed decades, Edinburgh has invested a lot of cash and policy in cycling. And they've now pushed up um, cycling to work to about 7 to 8% of all journeys. Meanwhile, it's still very low in Glasgow. However, in the last very few years in Glasgow, suddenly there's been a quite big in, in, increase in interest by the council. And Edinburgh, Glasgow Council now has a very flourishing bike share scheme and they've got some quite extensive lengths of um, segregated cycle routes. So obviously, 
competition between the two cities is hotting up. And I actually asked a Glasgow cycling officer the other day if when they were chatting over their coffee, they ever talked about rivalry between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And the answer from this cycle officer was, well, we hardly talk about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think Adam needs to, <laughs> needs to listen to that one. Um, last week, I was at another festival of cycling event, and this was the talk by Peter Walker, the Guardian columnist on cycling. Excellent guy, he's written an excellent book recently. He was asked, how do you persuade decision makers to do more for cycling? He said, one key factor is luck. It's a question of whether the people taking the decisions, A, understand cycling as a mode of transport, and B, have the politi political guts to push it. Both of these are essential. And I think I can genuinely say that all three of our speakers tonight fit that mold. Daisy Narayanan, um, who is the leader of the Edinburgh Transformation Project, um, is also the Deputy Director of Sustrans Scotland. She's been transferred for a year um, to the council. She trained as an architect and an urban designer, moved to the UK 15 years ago, and always gets about um, for her local journeys by bike and on foot. She's been on the government task force, which has been looking into why early segregated projects in Scotland suffered a lot of political and public opposition. And rumor has it that it's thanks to Daisy that the recommendations of this task force, which has just come out, are considerably stronger than would otherwise have been the case. Rumor has it. Um, David Begg is leader of the Glasgow Connectivity Commission. Oh, I, I should say, um, have a look at the pictures up there. I've, I missed the one of Daisy, but <laughs> that will have been up just now. Um, David is the leader of Glasgow Connectivity Commission. He's the CEO of a transport consultancy, the publisher of a professional transport journal, a former advisor to the Labour government, and many other similar qualifications. However, far more important than that, he was transport convener in Edinburgh in the 1990s. And I think, without flattering him too much, I hope, I think I can say he probably was one of the most far-seeing and indeed courageous transport conveners that we've ever had, both on public transport and on cycling. Remember, this was over 20 years ago when public appetite and interest in cycling was far, far less than it is now. And the motoring lobby might seem strong now, but in many ways had even more of a hold then. But um, David introduced the greenways for buses which took large amounts of space away from cars. He was involved in the banning of cars from Princess Street. It's hard to believe that they were once there. And he installed the Princess Street cycle lanes. And of course, since he left, um, they have been removed by a subsequent council. Similarly, the bus greenways have deteriorated rather as well. Um, the, bus, the cycle lanes in Printer Street were the advisory sort, which are not what we think are the ideal, but 20 years ago, it really was revolutionary to have cycle lanes in Printer Street. So I was sent by David's PA a sort of traditional mugshot, but I thought I'd much prefer this photo, <laughs> which is David um, and Edinburgh City Council opening the Printer Street cycle lane. So it would be great to see something like that again, the new council with great big banner, safer, cleaner, better, and um, segregated cycle lanes along Princess Street, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so anyway, we're absolutely delighted to have David back here tonight. Um, Adam is the leader of Edinburgh City Council, the youngest ever? I believe so. I believe so, right. Um, he was the cycling champion and deputy transport convener in the previous council before the last elections. Now, since last year's council election, the SNP group on Edinburgh Council with Leslie McInnes as the transport convener has been very, very positive on cycling. But I think it's no secret that before last year's election, the SNP group on the council was considerably less supportive of cycling and Adam was 
to some extent, not totally isolated, but had a tricky job there. Um, <laughs> this is all rumour has it, by the way. Um, you might remember that at that time there was a huge controversy over the proposed West East cycle route at Roseburn. Would it or would it not go ahead? Would it be cancelled even? And rumour has it that behind the scenes, Adam worked his magic within the SNP group and managed to persuade the old guard um, to turn around and support the project. So I think I'm fully justified in saying that all three of our speakers tonight not only get cycling as a mode of transport, but they've got the guts to do something about it. So I'm really looking forward to this evening. Hope they live up to what I've been saying. Um, <laughs> after, after the speakers, I've got two or three announcements to make, and then we'll have hopefully a, a nice long question and answer session, which will be chaired by Kirsty Lewin. Um, Kirsty is a board member of Sustrans UK, and I think she's also someone who fits the moulds that I have just been talking about. So, um, without more ado, I'll pass over to Daisy. Thanks. Well, no pressure, Dave, thank you. <laughs> I feel like a bit of a fraud. I'm stood here with David, David Beck sitting here and with all of you. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I love to do and, you know, being sat here. It's incredible. So thank you again. Thanks, Dave, for the introduction, and thanks to Spokes for, for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Dave said, I'm Daisy Narayanan. I am a Deputy Director of Sustrans Scotland, seconded to City of Edinburgh Council for four days a week for, one, for the next year to lead the City Centre Transformation Project. But before I kick off my presentation, I'd like to reflect on this quote from one of my heroes, um, Jane Jacob. She's an architect. Um, because, you know, we are about to embark on reshaping a living, breathing, um, a successful, a magical city. And we need to do it right. We need to do it with rigor. We need to do it with integrity. And we need to do it together. We need to do it collaboratively. This isn't my vision. This isn't Adam's vision or, you know, um, one person or one council's vision. This is for all of us to, to shape. And here's an opportunity for us to do it. What an incredible privilege. So... Um, so just a, a moment to pause and, and reflect on that. Uh, I was approached last November by Paul Lawrence. Uh, he came to me and said, uh, how would you like to lead the City Centre Transformation Project? And I picked up my jaw from the floor and I said, the 21-year-old architect in, you know, who's just graduated in Bombay is, is jumping up and down with excitement. Uh, but I'm intrigued and I'm interested to know what your vision is for the city. Uh, before I can say yes or no. And that was a really interesting conversation. And, you know, it's a long story short, I started with the council um, in March, um, about three months ago, being phased in, so fully in post, four days a week um, since the start of April. And it's been quite a, quite a few busy weeks, as you can imagine. My remit is to come to a TNE committee uh, next, next March with a city centre strategy, an action plan, a delivery plan, and an investment strategy. So it's not going to be just words or, or a, a plan. It's, it's, it is an action plan. It's got to be underpinned by money and how it's all going to be delivered. So a lot of sleepless nights ahead, I can say, in the next year. Um, it's been an interesting few weeks. I, since I've joined, we've clarified governance structures. I lead a project team. I was very clear that the project team has to be cross-departmental. Um, I report to a cross-departmental board. Uh, there's a central Edinburgh development working group that is set up, which is cross-party, cross-portfolio, uh, led by the transport convener. Uh, it's got the conveners and deputy conveners of housing, transport, planning, and economy. And to me, um, and it's got the opposition spokespeople of transport. And it's an, it's an amazing group, and it, it's there to provide steer and advice, but it's also there to, to to be taken you know, along as part of the journey, sorry, cheesy language, but as part of the next year to see you know, what the constraints are right from the beginning and what the opportunities and what magic we can make when we, when we work together. 
So to me, this collaborative and cross-portfolio working is key to the success of this project, and hopefully one that brings life to, you know, we always talk about this aspiration for an integrated approach to people in place. That's my mantra I've been using for years. So hopefully this, this kind of approach will, will help make that happen. Uh, I've had the good fortune to, I, I studied architecture in Bombay. I've had the good fortune to live in many cities across the world. I grew up in India and Southeast Asia. Uh, but I remember that 2004 when I came to Edinburgh to study. And I, you know, that moment I'm sure when, you know, you look back and you see that amazing skyline and you think, wow, you know, it's a moment that stays with you. And 14 years later, I still find this city magical. Look at that, isn't that incredible? Um, you know, the closes, the medieval streets, the bus drivers and Lodium buses who make your day with their, hello, good morning, cherry. And they spread that cheer through the city. I think it's, it's amazing what we have here. Uh, so it is, as I said, an immense privilege for me to take on this role. And I'm conscious that I'm not starting from scratch. I'm taking forward work that incredible people have started before me, like David, yourself and um, you know, Ricardo Marini and people who've come in and tried to shape this, this um, from the beginning. So I said, we're not starting from scratch. Dave, you mentioned we've had Jan Gehr come here to his public spaces, public life report. We've had the Royal Mile Action Plan. We've had the Princess Street Development Framework. We've had Edinburgh 2050 Vision. So you know, we've had five years at least of going out and asking questions, what do people want? So we're not starting from scratch. We, we know what people want. And things haven't really changed in terms of what people are coming back to us. We have unique, unique strengths. We've got an outstanding built heritage. We have a strong civic, cultural, commercial heart. We have a public transport system that works well, that is loved. And we have a strong identity as people you know, from Edinburgh. But obviously, not everything is perfect. Um, you can see uh, Edinburgh is a growing city. And we have huge issues to tackle. You, know, you mentioned George Street being a car park and Princess Street being a a bus station, you, you, the festival time especially, when you look at uh, how the pavements are crowded, that's not what a World Heritage City should be. Um, we've got issues with consistency of approach sometimes in how we design our city centers, the materials we, we use, um, and the dominance of vehicular traffic. And these are acknowledged issues. People are saying this back to us in our conversations. Um, and we also have data, and data is telling us that status quo is not an option. We're a growing city. I was talking to David earlier today, and 500,000 people in 2016 forecast to rise by 17%. We'll be touching 600,000 by 2040. We need infrastructure that, that moves along with us. Traffic congestion is on an average 40% extra at peak times. It's costing drivers money. It's costing drivers 1,000 pounds per annum. It's costing the city 225 million pounds per annum. 80% uh, of residents want to cycle more. Uh, bike Life report that Sustrans did shows that. Um, the experience of walking through the city center isn't particularly pre pleasant, especially, I have two little ones. We stuck at crossings in the rain and you see the cars going by and you just think, that's not fair, is it? Um, and cross-boundary commuting is an issue. So we've got data to say this. We've got 95,000 people commute from other local authority areas. And of that, two thirds, 63,300 people commute by car. And, you know, and we have people from Edinburgh going out. We've got 19,000 people going out of Edinburgh. But there is an issue there that needs to be solved. But we are going to solve this together, aren't we? So uh, when I started this role, I spent the first few weeks just talking to people, just talking internally within the council, outside with stakeholders and just people I know. And what does city centre transformation mean? What does it mean to you? And I've heard everything. It's such a broad church. And the word transformation is loaded. I feel the weight of that word on my shoulders. And I've heard everything. I've heard this is a transport strategy. It's a public realm strategy. Oh, it's, it's about us as a people. Uh, you're going to solve uh, you know, pollution issues in, by the waterfront. Um, so everything. So the first few weeks were spent you know, trying to focus in with the cross-party group, saying, what does this project actually mean? And what is it meant to do? And then the corollary benefits will come from that. Um, at the first meeting with the cross-party group, uh, we talked about what the city centre meant to us. And that was quite an emotive conversation. And I think it really brought, brought people together. Um, and for me, my city is one that's fun, that's enjoyable, that's safe, designed for people like me, for diversity, for, you know, for women to feel safe, for, you know, for a person from Asia to feel that like this is home. Um, and 
one that's you know, easy to move in, that's healthy. And it was interesting hearing what, what the city and what the city center meant to different people there. So what did we hear? We heard that the city center is home. We're home to 60,000 people. It's, it's, it's home. We've got residents that live in the city. And that's quite unique for a small European city, uh, for a capital city. Um, it's an inspiring place, we know, to live, work, to play, to visit. There's a monumentality about Edinburgh, but it's also built to human scale. There's a lovely uh, combination of those two, which is quite unique to us. It's built on the shoulders of giants. You know, we should not lose the legacy of the past while we're looking to the future. But there are some very clear tensions, Adam, you know more than anyone. Uh, you know, the resident versus visitor tension, the, the age-old perennial cyclist versus pedestrian versus driver. You know, it is a World Heritage Site, and we, in the process of, in, you know, we have to ensure the integrity, the richness of what we have, while continuing to progress towards being a global city. So we've had some really amazing discussions at the working group, and we've distilled those thoughts into a working vision. You know, we went away from the, we're going to be the best city for X, Y, Z, because how do you measure that? You can't measure that. You know, it's, we're going to be an exceptional city center for all and we're going to work collaboratively. Again, it's, you know, we ha I keep saying this over and over again, we have to do this together. From then, I won't read all of that, I promise you, Dave, I'm conscious of time as well, but from, from that group, in the, in the in three months that I've been in the role, we have an agreed working vision, we have five aims and we have 15 objectives, and they've all gone to T&E committee in, um, in, in May, a couple of weeks ago and it's been, it's been uh, taken forward, which I think is brilliant, and it just again shows how the cross-party, cross-portfolio group works really well. Um, it's, I think it was at the t &E committee when uh, Councillor Arthur said, well, it's a bit motherhood apple pie, isn't it? But at this stage, yes, the vision probably is, but the objectives are quite clear. Uh, we've, we've placed them under the umbrella of Edinburgh 2050 vision, so fair, connected, thriving, and inspired. And the connected bit, I'm really pleased to say that there is agreement to say one of the objectives is to prioritize access and movement by foot, by bike, and public transport, and to reduce vehicular dominance. And I think to be able to say that as an objective, when you come to the actions that are going to be smart, measurable, you know, this is what, what the city has signed up to, and this is what, you know, it, there's no two ways to do that. There is one way to do that. So yes, it is a bit, it is broad, but it is clear enough that when it comes to tough decisions, going back to the objectives will help us make those decisions. Uh, very quickly, we, the other things that, that I've been doing with the past three months is working closely with, with teams within the council. Part of the, the beauty of being seconded in is that I can float. I can float across teams and I can you know, go to planning and say, what do you think about this and transport and start to make those connections and working closely with them to ensure that the city center strategy is aligned with the current and emerging work especially the three projects that we're working together. The city center transformation works with the city, cent the city transport strategy, which was the local transport strategy, now being called city transport strategy, and the low emission zone consultation. So we've done our consultation as a group because we are going to ask broadly the same questions of people, and there's no point going out and asking the same things three times. So I think that's quite a good way of the council showing that it's, it's quite joined up. The other thing is that's a strategic level. What I'm doing, there's 22 projects within, the, within my, my porous boundary, as I call it. It's the World Heritage Boundary. Within that, there's 22 projects, all at different stages. And, and you know, we hear that all the time. You said that, Dave. You know, you get stuck. The projects seem to get stuck somewhere along the way. And no one quite knows where. So one of the things that I'm quite keen to do in my year is to start to unlock those blockages and ensure that we can, we can start to capitalize on the fact that we have a holistic vision now and start to push, to, push towards the same thing, hopefully, hopefully make sure that it, it all gets done together and with the same objectives in mind. Um, again, very quickly, things that we're going to do, we're starting to set up a website, working with the team to storyboard content. Very clear that this has to be something that's interactive, it's fun, it's inspiring. You know, it's, it's transformation, it's not tweaking. We have to, do, we have to make sure that we're pulling in best practice from across the world. I went to a talk by Isabel Dresden from, um, at Arab, there was a lecture. She talked about how in London when she was deputy mayor, she got um, almost like, you know, people giving her ideas on what to do and that, that really 
worked well. So, you know, a place where everyone can, you know, gather their thoughts, their ideas, bring it across so then the team can work through them and see what we can take forward. Uh, meetings, speaking to people, this is an opportunity for us to design, to co-design, you know, there's this whole jargon around co-design at the moment, but what a great opportunity to do that at the start of the, the process. And the project timeline. Uh, so again, we've had a few busy weeks of conversations, ideas, gathering, and all of that. Uh, the, you know, the, the official process is laid out. We're going to go to, to the public after the August t &E committee with, um, with some ideas. I'm hoping to test some scenarios. I'm hoping to test some, you know, do some pilots. Uh, festival season is on, so why not try, try different things? Um, but then, for me, the scenarios, you know, things that are going to happen in the background, which will start to inform what we say to the public, that is key. Uh, you know, there's things that, you know, all of us know, traffic uh, modeling, the dark art of traffic modeling, as I call it. Uh, and that's what tends to lead decision-making process. But I think we have an opportunity here to say, yes, we're looking at access and movement for people who live, work, play, and visit. We're looking at how we support businesses through deliveries, freight, waste collection, do things differently, integrated urban mobility, hubs, interchanges. But most of all, starting to layer in your health and well-being, start to layer in your equalities, heritage impact assessment, take this conversation away from just transport to social justice. This is about a city center that is for all of us. And why should one person have more right to be in, on the Royal Mile than someone in a wheelchair or someone who's six years old or someone who looks like me. Um, so this to me, taking that conversation away from driver versus pedestrian versus, you know, that will start to in make a better conversation and lead to better results in the end. Um, August will take the scenarios, hopefully some scenarios to the city for testing and for seeing how, what the appetite there is out there for change as well. But I'd like to end, I, I, I don't know how much time I have, five minutes? I'll just flick through very quickly. Uh, Dave asked me when you asked me to speak, um, what cities are you looking to for, for inspiration? And um, I'll just go through a very quick series of slides that have, that have inspired me, my approach, uh, City of Edinburgh Council approach. And, but before I do that, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Stuart Hay, uh, Living Streets Head. I have shamelessly pinched these next series of slides from him <laughs> because we collaborated on a paper for the STAR conference last month and um, he did all the work and I took all the undeserved credit for it. So <laughs> I'll rattle through these really quickly. To me, and well, you know, to us, we think the, the key factors for an active city, for a healthy city, you need to have a strong vision, you need to have significant investment that reallocates space. Um, you need to have a will willingness to disrupt, to test, to learn. We need clear targets that can be measured, clear outcomes, and we need political leadership. And as Dave, you said, we have that now in Edinburgh. We have that with Adam yourself, with Councillor McInnes, with the group that is cross-party. I think there is that drive now to push things forward. Active cities are healthy cities. They're successful cities. We know that. You know, Copenhagen, I love that picture of the tram, sorry. Um, but Copenhagen was not what it, this is now, but that's what it used to be. That started in 1962 with one street, Stroget, which was, as you probably know, it was really controversial at the time. Businesses hated it. What do you mean pedestrianize the street, take the cars away? 73, they extended the pedestrian network. So it took a few years for them to do that slowly, take, take parking away slowly. 2013, that's where we're at. You know, and it can be done. We can do this. That's Stroget now. It's incredible. It's amazing, amazing, vibrant, full of life, daytime, nighttime. Uh, yesterday, I don't know if, if you probably caught it in The Guardian, Copenhagen Eyes, um, he talked about how in 2016, the number of bicycles entering the city center exceeded the number of cars. And that's incredible and inspiring. And Jane again, Jane Jacobs, she's talked about cities being immense laboratories. We have to trial things, but we have to trial things that are high quality. We can't just put a couple of traffic cones and say that's, you know, that's we're, we're testing that segregated lane. It has to be done well. New York, uh, you know, Jan Gale's pocket, play, pocket parks that have become permanent. Times Square, that's a real transformation of a public space. Paris, um, the the first Sunday of every month is Car Free Sunday. Uh, yesterday, was it yesterday, last week, where you saw 6.5% redu reduction in cars in 2018. Incredible what you can do when you have the leadership. Brussels, um, 
That's the kind of thing we need to do more often. When we go to consultation, we don't go with plans and engineering drawings. You go with, this is what it could be. You know, that sea of tarmac could be that. And how can you, how can anyone argue against that? We need to do more of this. Barcelona, the super blocks. Um, I, I'll just r rattle through these because I'm sure you know. In this room, this is my, this is my spiritual home. You know all of this. So, uh, Oslo, with your, um, you know, 1.5 billion euros that they're planning to invest in cycling infrastructure, car-free city center by 2019, which brings me to my tiny, tiny start for trialing things. And next week, as you probably know, um, is. Um, we, we're organizing a summer summit around um, clean, clean Air Day, which is Scottish Government Clean Air Day. And I'm happy to come, come back and talk to you or answer questions because I'm conscious of time. But please come. We've got a road closure. I know it's not as much as most of us would want, but it's a start. It's a Thursday. It's three hours in the morning for a city center street and part of George Street. And we're going to transform it. And road closures are red herrings. Road closures are it's where, how you open the road to people. You close it and you see the magic happen. You have art and music and dance and theater and all the fun stuff that people should be doing. And that's what's going to happen next week because the weather is going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, I would like to end on a picture because I shamelessly use my kids as props. My son is seven and my daughter is four. She's on seven and a half and four and a half, as they say to me. And that's in Barcelona. And that was a snow day in when do we have the crazy snow day a couple of months ago? And that's what city should be full of delight. It should be full. That's the legacy. This, this, this work is for them. And, you know, being in the council and working with the teams, I have an insight now into what constraints they have and what battles they're fighting and how swamped they are. So I just like to end on a plea that when, when, we, when the council does get things right, we need to be critical friends. And we need to shout, and we need to say, this is great, and can we have more of this, please? And when things don't quite go according to plan, be kind, be gentle. <laughs> um, so I'll stop at this, and I'm sure there'll be loads of questions, but I hope I've given you a flavor of the past three months. It's been a bit nonstop. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you very much, Daisy. Um, just to say, in relation to Daisy's point about the um, summer summit, the front page of this screen handout that's on your chairs, that's all about that. We, it's really important for people to come along to that and tell all your friends and colleagues about that, because this is um, hopefully a start, and if it goes well, it'll encourage the council to do more, work on towards car-free Sundays, um, more great places and events like that. So, um, thanks very much, Daisy. And now, um, pass on to David. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's good to be back in Edinburgh. And uh, Edinburgh's in great hands with Daisy. I love the passion. I love the commitment. Um, so well done, Daisy. And uh, Dave Defoe, if I, was, if I was given that knighthood, it's not that I ever will, I'd give one to Dave Defoe. Yeah. Dave, I want to say 40 years you've been doing this for Spokes, Dave. It's incredible. And, I, and I, if I just take you back to, I think I want to say 1985, and I was writing the, uh, the manifesto for the Labour Party going into the 1986 regional elections, and Dave Defoe came to see me and said, you should make a commitment to put 2%, it's incredibly small now, 2% of the council's capital budget into cycling. And then it went. And now it's 10%. And at that time, I think we probably had less than 2% of people <laughs> traveling to work by bike, and it's now up to 7%. So I'm fascinated not so much by who makes the decisions and what politicians make the decision, but who makes the weather that determine often how politicians behave. Who determines whether a politician puts up an umbrella or wears the sunglasses? Who dictates that weather? And it's people like Dave Defoe, 
Sandy Scott, Scotland, lots of other people in this room, because I've been away for a long time, so I don't recognize everyone now, who actually give encouragement to politicians who want to be radical to do what they're doing. And uh, I kind of forgot that you, you spoke, Dave, just how, I guess, contentious a lot of the things we did 30 years actually were. And I, I was reminded of it when I was traveling. At the time, I was advising the government and chairing the Commission for Integrated Transport. So I was commuting from Edinburgh to London and spending what seemed like half my life on the East Coast Main Line. And I was traveling from King's Cross to Edinburgh. And the guy across from me, we were sitting in a dining car. That was the days where you had really good dining cars on the trains. And the guy across from me quite innocently said to me, so what do you do for a living? And I, I don't know about you, but everyone's a transport expert. I felt like saying I'm a, I'm a brain surgeon, and that would have probably ended it. And I said, evasively, I said, I work with the government on transport. And he put down his soup spoon, and he looked at me menacingly, and he said, you can't do anything about that guy, Davy Begg, in Edinburgh, can you? <laughs> now, I, I, I thought, if I said, well, that's me, uh, that kind of ruins the lunch, doesn't it? So I thought, at the time, focus groups were all the rage. So I thought, oh, I need to find out. I need some feedback here. What have I done? And I knew what I'd done to offend him. He, was, he viewed the transport problem from behind the windscreen of a car and was completely oblivious to everyone else's need. So I tried to convert him, and I said, well, you must be impressed that Edinburgh um, has uh, got the fastest growth in bus patronage in the UK at the time, and Greenways have speeded up buses. He hated Greenways because it slowed up his car journey. And then I said, you must be impressed that Edinburgh's doubled the number of people who have cycled over the last decade, despite the fact that it's sometimes wet and hilly and often windy. Wasn't interested, cycle lanes take away space from him as a motorist and slow things up. And then I found out he had children. I said, you must be impressed that they've half the number of fatalities over the last decade. He hated speed bumps and 20 mile per hour zones and all of that. Now, this conversation I had with them went on all the way from King's Cross to York. I, I was getting nowhere. And then when we got to York, I paid for my lunch, and he saw my name on the MasterCard. <laughs> and do you remember in Faulty Towers when things started to go wrong for Basil? <laughs> I, don't thought, I, thought he was, he, I thought he was going to bang his head off the window. He was so He said, look, there's some fantastic things happening in Edinburgh. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> And anyway, every cloud's got a silver lining because he ended up paying for my lunch. <laughs> and one of the great things about not being around, I can tell that story again, and people have forgotten all about it, but it's, it's absolutely true. It's really tough being the politician trying to make the change. Not easy. Um, and, and the one thing I remember was I, I decided to give up my car because I thought, what a hypocrite am, am I if I'm driving my car into the council car parking space and telling everyone to use sustainable transport? So I gave up my car and cycled and got the bus. And then the Daily Record uh, had me on the front page and said, I shouldn't be in charge of transport because I'm not a motorist and I don't understand motorist problems. <laughs> and then they would follow me around to see if I ever got in a car. It got really weird and really, really, really strange. This Glasgow Connectivity Commission, it, said, it says up there, Glasgow Connectivity, it said mission earlier on, Dave, and it's been changed. <laughs> do you know what is a mission? And uh, I was persuaded to do it because I'm just so impressed by the, the new, the new councillors that are leading Glasgow. And we've, we've got Anna Richardson here tonight and the leader, Susan Aitken. I can tell you, they do not view the transport problem from behind the windscreen of a car. They're up for change. They're up for radical change, and it's quite exciting working with politicians who want to be so radical in trying, in trying to change things. So let me just give you some, i quickly run through my 10 observations on Glasgow and make some comparison with Edinburgh. And I'm, I'm so nervous about, about, about doing this, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. I mean, firstly, Dave, you mentioned about the rivalry between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, for the last 15 years, I've, my company have run Scottish Transport Awards and I chair the judging panel. And all the evidence I've seen is that Glasgow's performed better on transport over the last 15 years than Edinburgh. 
right? Uh, that may be contentious here, but that's certainly the impression. And I can, I can just look, if you just look at, you can, you can actually look at the number of times Glasgow have won the local authority of the year in transport and special awards for, for cycling, etc. And what Glasgow are embarking, are embarking upon just now with a low emission zone, that is really radical. And it's, it's, it's very, very laudable. Historians are going to look back and ask, why did it take us so long to get a grip of poor air quality within our cities? I don't know if you're familiar with the Avenues project in Glasgow, starting in Socky Hall Street, hopefully spreading out to another eight streets. It is fantastic. It reminds me, Daisy, of the slide you showed at Brussels when you showed all the trees and everything. The Avenues pro project is a radical reallocation of space, and it deserves a huge, a huge amount of support. And Glasgow have done really well at growing the, the number of people cycling, albeit from a low base in the last, in the last 10 years. But Glasgow suffers from decisions that were made a generation ago. Glasgow moved in an opposite direction in the 60s and the 70s from Edinburgh. Glasgow were influenced by post-war planners and architects such as Robert Bruce uh, and Abercrombie and Buchanan. And Glasgow decided to firstly knock down the tenement buildings, and they needed knock down, but dispersing people away from the city centre, and decided to put an M8 motorway through the heart of the city. Now, the one thing that we know, and to quote Fred, Fred Kent, the American urban planner from Columbia University, if you, if you design cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. If you design cities for people and places, you get people and places. So Glasgow's trying really hard to, 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 to overcome what were, at the time, was viewed as a modern approach to transport. It was very much an American way of doing it. Um, and it wasn't the right approach for Glasgow. In fact, at one point, there was plans to knock down the city chambers and Glasgow Central Station and build new modern American-type skyscrapers. Edinburgh, and this is what we've got, we've got to sometimes thank politicians not for doing things, but not doing things at times. So in Edinburgh, in the 1670s, they opposed the, the road building plans, and the, there was going to be a, a bypass to the north going right along the shore of Leith. When I came into the council in 1986, we stopped plans from the then Conservative administration to extend the M8 motorway right into the heart of the city. So, so Labour actually took control of Edinburgh from the Conservatives in the 1970s on a manifesto of opposing road building. And, you know, thankfully, we didn't do that. But you, you, you look back and you look at some of the gorgeous Edinburgh architecture that would have been demolished in the name of so-called progress, and we just thank our lucky stars that it, didn't, that it didn't happen then. What Edinburgh's got going for it, and we need, to try and, we need to try and create in Glasgow, is a much higher percentage of the population living in the city centre. Daisy, you were telling me that 60,000 people about that, live in Edinburgh city centre, more than 10% of the population. That's healthy, that's vibrant. In Glasgow, it's 3%. Now, if you live in the city centre, you're much better connected. You're much likely to be able to walk or cycle. Uh, public transport gravitates towards a cent city centre and it, it, it serves people much, much better. So a lot of the time, the things we've got to do aren't building shiny new trams or trains or new bus routes, it's planning decisions. And if you, if you say to me, what's the most important planning decision right now, or what's the best way we can transform connectivity in Glasgow, you're not going to believe it, but it's putting really good schools right in the heart of the city. It's encouraging families to let, it's not just young, uh, upwardly mobile generation, it's, it's families that we need to get back into the city centre. That needs facilities, that needs schools. And the other, if there's one stat that I want to give you that really jumped out at me and I thought, wow, I just, this just can't be right. I'm always fascinated by how we allocate road space. Right now, there's all sorts of financial constraints on, on, on local authorities and it just seems to get worse all the time. But you look at the most precious resource that local politicians are in control of, it's road space and how they allocate it. In Glasgow, 25% of all land is allocated to roads to move traffic. 25%. In Edinburgh, it's 12%. Now, 
When you look at the pavement space in Glasgow, when I, when I wander around Glasgow, people say, well, there's a lot of congestion. There is, it's on the pavement a lot of the time. Right? That's where a lot of the congestion is. In Glasgow, while 25% of road space is to move traffic, only 8% of road space is for pedestrians. In Edinburgh, 12% of road space for traffic, 10% for pedestrians. That, and we started on this journey that Dave talked about to widen the pavements in the Royal Mile. The Royal Mile used to be a four-lane carriageway. The pavements were so, so narrow. If I was going back in time, I, I would just wish we'd pedestrianized the whole of the Royal Mile and left it for cyclists and pedestrians. But fantastic street. We didn't quite have the courage to do it then. But it's how you allocate space. And people talk about Birmingham as being the car city uh, in the UK, but Glasgow has got one-third more road space than Birmingham. Now, you might say, that's terrible, and we need to change. The upside is, there's a lot of room to reallocate road space in Glasgow. You, you know, you, 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 the... the tr the highways engineers cannot say we don't have enough space to do this. They've got loads of space, right? So you can do the Avenues project, and you can be really radical in a city like Glasgow. Um, the one thing that worries me most about Glasgow is transport inequality. 50% of all deprived citizens in Scotland live in Glasgow. Glasgow's got the lowest car ownership levels in the whole of the UK, which seems really perverse when they've got that amount of road space, doesn't it? So we need to change that. And, and, and this transport equality, people on uh, low incomes contribute much less to air quality. They tend not to drive cars. Right? They tend to use public transport. But people on low incomes, while they contribute the least towards poor air quality, they suffer the most also from poor air quality. That's a transport inequality. If you live in Glasgow and you don't live near a railway station and you don't have a car, and that's a lot of people fall into that category, there's a real danger that you're marginalized. In the Northeast estate in Glasgow called Milton, there's some people there we've been told just can't even access fresh fruit and vegetables. So they're actually being cut off. But the, the most challenging issue right now for Glasgow is to arrest the decline in bus use. Uh, you, do you know this? best things about Edinburgh is an absolutely fantastic bus service. And trust me, I, we, we tend to take things for granted. That is the best bus service in the UK. You compare it to Glasgow, and we've got a 40% decline in bus patronage in Glasgow in a decade. It's fixable. We can do things about it, but things need to happen really quickly because bus passengers are disappearing really fast. The rail service is a fantastic success. The... the the best rail service outside of London, the most comprehensively used, but it's bursting at the seams. I was amazed that in the last 15 years there are four times more people using Glasgow Queen Street Station. So the challenge in Glasgow is how do you actually cope with the volume of rail passengers going forward um, in the future? And I think another challenge, and I, I think it applies to Edinburgh too, I, I am not convinced that we've got the governance structure right in Scotland. Um, a decision was made 25 years ago to abolish the regional councils. The regional councils were set up for a good reason. They, they covered a travel to work area. Very difficult to plan for transport, strategic planning, economic development on the city, city boundaries we've got just now. So down south, you've got powerful mayors who are covering city regions in places like Liverpool, in Manchester. We don't have that in, in Scotland, so the commission that I'm chairing for Glasgow City Council, we want to have a good look at the governance structure and actually ask the question, is that governance structure fit for purpose? One last point. The person that inspired me most when I was a politician in Edinburgh was Enrico, Enrico Penalosa, the mayor of Bogota, population of eight million people in Colombia. And he's famous for that quote when he says, a successful city is not a city where the poor drive cars, but it's a city where the rich use public transport and sustainable transport. And he wanted to buy a golf course and turn it into a green space for everyone to use. 
And it strikes me that one of the things about Edinburgh, it's awash with beautiful green spaces and parks. It's something that Glasgow doesn't quite have and something that Glasgow needs and something that the Avenues Project is going to help just with tree-lined streets which are going to completely transform everything. So in conclusion, politicians who want to make a change are dependent on people in this room who campaign, who campaign relentlessly. I used to always try and please Dave Defoe because <laughs> I respected Dave and he influenced me. Right? So the role that you've got is absolutely crucial. There'll, there'll be all sorts of pressure groups who are telling you you can't take space away from the cars. You have to be brave. And to quote what well, I think is the best American president, it's not difficult saying that he's better than what we've got just now, but the best American president of the last century, F.D. Roosevelt, who said that the difference between a politician and a statesman is that a politician thinks about the next generation. Sorry, a politician thinks about the next election, but a statesman thinks about the next generation. That's what we're to do. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Thanks for a really inspiring talk there, David. Um, and now Adam is going to give us a 10-minute response to what we've heard so far. Sorry, hope that picks me up, does it? No? Okay. Thanks for that. I'll do it the old-fashioned way. Is that working? Booming, I would have thought. Um, so a year ago, actually it was probably a year ago today-ish, the, the spokes breakfast was in city chambers. We hadn't quite formed our coalition yet, um, but I was uh, thankful asked to, to speak at it. And as we we're on the cusp of forming an administration, I said that I wanted our administration in Edinburgh to be the most pro-cycling that this city's ever had. And I think actually we're managing to put our money and our political capital where our mouth is. Um, Absolutely, I agree with Daisy that this is not about modes of transport. We sometimes get into that debate in transport that you look at the space from end to end, from building to building, and then you look at what you can put in, how wide can the pavement be, how much uh, of a cycleway can you put in, how much of a busway can you put in, what have you got left for car, and then you have uh, X minus whatever you've usually short by in Edinburgh because we're a historic city with small streets. And then you try and work out the competing interests of how you can squeeze everything onto that space. And the bit of that decision-making process that is missing when you look at these things in a, a bitty form is why is X road user or why road user using that and where are they getting to? The purpose is not to build spaces, as, Dave was saying, uh, as David was saying, uh, for what you uh, aspire or what people would expect to see there, parking, loading, all these things. It's about what the space is actually being used for and what could it be used for. Um, Interestingly, some of the stats on uh, bus usage, we're still, as a city, increasing in our bus patronage. We're still increasing about one in four people in Edinburgh walk to work as their primary mode of transport. I think we are the highest anywhere in Scotland for that. Part of that is probably because the space is there for people to use it. And part of it is uh, some people in Edinburgh are just tight and don't want to pay the, the bus fare. Um, the other element of Edinburgh's public space is the number of visitors we have here. So our city centre belongs to all of us who use it. It belongs to every single person. It's very much the heart of the community uh, of the entire city. But the millions of people who visit here every year um, cause an issue, and it's a great issue to have. It creates the vibrancy, the thing that really makes Edinburgh Edinburgh, the thing that makes people want to move here, people like me from the distant land of Paisley who want to come and make their life here because it's an interesting, fantastic place to live. 
I was at a dinner last night, um, toasting, literally toasting with 53% uh, Chinese alcohol, so nobody um, shout too loud at me, but um, toasting the uh, new direct flight to China, and the, the ambassador um, who'd flown up um, from London was talking about the potential that this could have for our city, and he said, China's a very big place. We could end up with a million extra visitors coming to Edinburgh. He said, he said, if you want 10 million, we could do 10 million. It's no problem for us. <laughs> and I think that, that articulates quite well the problem and the opportunity that we have as a city. There are so many people who want to visit. There are so many people who want to live and work here that we need to find a way of accommodating that in a way that celebrates the things that people can bring from all over the world, but in a way that continues to leave that city centre with... Uh, 20%, 15%, something like that, of our population living right in the heart of our city centre. We still want to be a living, beating heart of a city centre. We don't want um, our city to be a museum. I think we've done a lot in the last year. When I compare the last administration um, to this, I think we are off and running. Um, when I think of the one project that we managed to deliver and the other one that we managed to secure in terms of final design. And I was uh, grateful for Dave's um, insider secrets in terms of the, the efforts that I went to to convince my uh, own party to support the East West Cycleway. What he didn't give me credit for, that maybe he should have, uh, was, was the political machinations that I had to go through to get the Conservatives to back the East West Cycleway, which they did in the end. Um, we'd managed to deliver about four out of six phases of Leith Walk. Um, it's something I've cycled hundreds of times since it's been built, and I really look forward to the rest of it being built because I think the northern side uh, is really good. We've also managed to, in the previous administration, clarify designs on east-west. But since then, even in the last year, we've managed to secure, we're the only authority in the whole country to secure two Community Links Plus programs. These are two major pieces of infrastructure, and I personally led our bid in Sustrans to make sure that we got what I thought we were bidding for, which was uh, one project. Delighted that the Scottish Government matched our energy and enthusiasm for both our projects and gave us the funding for both. And they wouldn't have done that, even if they wanted to be really nice and, and uh, tart up their green credentials. They wouldn't have done that unless we had managed to convey competent, solid plans that that gave a rationale of what we're trying to do. And when you think of the two schemes, one in the west of the city, trying to link a very non-cycling friendly environment of um, the Gyle to other cycle infrastructures. And when you think of the link that could happen between George Street and the meadows and the links that exist already from uh, the meadows in the south side, these are really interesting projects which get us to a point where the city is far, far better connected to the city centre. And that leaves us with a problem, and it's a problem that Daisy's been tasked with, uh, with solving. What do we do when people get to the city centre and how do we improve that? Um, I don't know if she'll mind me saying this or not, but I'll just say it anyway. Uh, the transport conveyor, Leslie McInnes, came into my office one day and she said, We've been doing some work on the city centre transformation stuff. And I said, that's good. That's, you know, things are going well. She said, I'm thinking of being really radical with it. What do you think? <laughs> and I responded, I'll give you the letters and then I'll give you three of the words. So I, I said, uh, J-F-D-I. Uh, um, the three words I'll give you is just do it. Um, I won't tell you what the... Uh, <laughs> the other one was... Um, but when you think of the amount of time we've spent as a city debating bike hire schemes, it's now being delivered. Um, now, when you think of the amount of time we've spent debating uh, residents' bike parking, it's now uh, going to be delivered and TRO's traffic regulation orders are going to be um, progressed to deliver it across the city. There's a huge amount that is being done in the city centre transformation as Daisy was saying, is not just a talking exercise, it's a doing exercise. It's an exercise to get our city centre in a position that it's not about creating access for cyclists. 
It's about creating a city centre that is fit for purpose, a city centre that puts people, the people who live there, the people who travel in there, the people who visit our city, at the absolute heart of it, that the uses that we all want to use in our city centre are at the absolute heart of our city centre. To, uh, to give Anna um, some uh, compliment, um, a couple of weeks ago I was standing in Sucky Hall Street thinking, at some point this would have been two lanes of traffic, parking, and a wee tiny pavement. And when you stand in a, a very heavily pedestrianised street like that and see the bustling vibrancy of it and imagine what it was like before, no one, not even the Tories, would propose, well, uh, would propose going backwards. So this is very much, placemaking is all about going forwards. It's all about building that progression towards a better city. Can I echo... Um, what some other people have said about, the, in fact, I think both speakers have, have talked about the easiness or not of change. It, it is difficult. It is difficult when you're trying to build better uh, active travel infrastructure and businesses are telling you they will go bust if uh, X or Y happens. Now, you can point to evidence, you can point to a whole host of other experiences and articulate and why that isn't the case but the lobbies are still hard fighting against change. And I would echo um, some of the sentiments of, of Daisy. While we might not get everything uh, lined up in a way that everyone is exactly happy with, um, I hope you'd admit uh, or ac accept or agree, um, at the end of this administration, if we've delivered everything that we've set out to deliver, and bear in mind the big infrastructure projects will be delivered in this term, so you'll be able to judge this bunch of politicians for delivery or not. If we manage to deliver that, hopefully you'll agree with my sentiment a year ago that our administration has been the best, uh, most supportive, most active one in support of cycling and active travel in the city. And I hope that record stands for no time at all, because I hope the administration that follows us are even better. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Adam. Um, well, there's plenty to think and discuss. Um, Kirsty's going to be running the QA session. So I'll leave Kirsty and Shane to sort out microphones and such like. And meanwhile, I've just got a few announcements um, to make. So I'll do that from the side. Um, you've got this green handout on your chairs. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the Thursday the 21st is really important for everyone to take part in. There are some other events on the back side of that sheet. And I'd just like to mention a couple for you to tick off if you've got your pen with you. Um, Saturday the 16th is the pop-up stalls in George Street parking spaces. And it is actually officially allowed, so you can go along in safety. Um, Monday the 18th is the fourth of the Spokes Festival of Cycling events, and that's in this building here. We hope a good number of, of you will come along to that. Um, so apart from events, I just want to say one or two things about volunteers. Um, the, um, c the Clean Air Day that Daisy's been talking about, in addition to all the outside events, there are some indoor events going on with speakers, workshops, some really top, top quality speakers there. Um, and we have got an opportunity to have stalls at two of those events. But we've only just heard about this, so we haven't got round to organising volunteers. So we're really hoping that there's a few people here who are going to volunteer. Um, <clears throat> if anyone is willing to volunteer, please talk to... Mies and Judy at the store at the end. And what we need is two people for Thursday the 21st between 12.30 and 3.30 and two people for Friday the 22nd between 9 o'clock and 1 o'clock. So if, if we can get a couple of people, that'd be great. We'll be able to have those stalls at those events, otherwise we won't. Um, those are one-off volunteering events but Spokes also depends on people who are more long-term, ongoing volunteers to help with more organizational type things. And we are needing two more of that sort of people. So again, you can talk to Mies and Judy at the back about this, but the two things we're needing, um, Mies really needs an assistant stalls organizer to work with her 
to keep our stalls organization going. And then secondly, um, Judy, who's been our office manager for a long time, is hoping to retire from that towards the end of the summer. So we're looking for an office manager type volunteer. And you could work with Judy over the next couple of months to get into the role. Um, but if you're vaguely interested, talk, talk to us at the back. Um, so yes, yeah, stalls. We've got a membership stall at the back. Um, Kenny there is running it. If you're not a member, we'd be delighted if you join. It's really helpful to us. And we can keep you in touch with when it's a good time to write to which politician about what and all that sort of thing. Um, and finally, we've just published the new edition of our West Lothian map, which also covers a big chunk of West Edinburgh. And that's on sale at our special store prices at the back. So um, thank you all very much. Pass over to Kirsty now. Should, should we clap? <laughs> right, can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. Um, I was interested that David mentioned um, Penulosa from Bogota. Um, I've been a cyclist for more decades than I can count. But when I went to Bogota for the first time, I went specifically bo to Bogota to go to the Ciclavia. And I've, I discovered there that on a Sunday, there are over one and a half million people on the streets. Imagine, I mean, the, the concept of that sort of blows your mind. And what was really amazing was that I developed a number of friendships with people who, who work in the Ciclavia, quite senior managers. And there are managers whose sole job it is is to run events off the back of the Ciclavia. So they have yoga and basketball and aerobics and football and all sorts of things going on in this event. And it's got so sophisticated now, Daisy, that um, they even have vets on the Ciclavia. So if you, if you have a low income but you have a pet, you can take your dog or your cat or your rabbit on a string or whatever along to the vet in the Ciclavia and get some free veterinary treatment. Now that's saying something, and I think <laughs> I'd like to see that in, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the street closures in Edinburgh. So it's amazing what you can do. As, as what was said, it's not just about shutting a street to traffic, it's about opening up streets for all the sorts of activities that you can undertake. Uh, so that's my little plug. Um, for those of you that know me, when I run a Q&A, we try to mix up genders, age, facial hair, glasses, sandals, boots, um, high vis, no high vis. So we'll try to do that fairly equally if we can. Um, so if someone before you has gone with a beard, the next person doesn't get to be a beard, okay? Um, we've got a microphone on each side, so we'll try to, to balance, but if we could have a mix. If you're normally really quiet, this is your big chance to ask some quite challenging questions. There was lots of ambition up here, so maybe we'll have a bit of probing about how real that is. So uh, should we have a start? Not a politician first. Uh, should we go down the back? Anyone down the back? A woman? Anyone very, uh, yes, I think, uh, yes, just down in, with, I think you've got a red, maybe a red t-shirt on, yeah. And so I should have said no commercial adverts and no speeches, please. <laughs> um, right, uh, I was wondering, I, I don't know, there's a lot of positive things happening, but some things are sort of not quite as positive, like, um, Back in the day when David Beck was um, around sort of the East Area Councillor, it was Nitri Mains Road that got made a double pavement, which for a while was a tool cycle and um, pedestrian, but it appears that the signs have come away now so, and cycling along the road, which is very busy at majority of the time, with very impatient car drivers and mm. vehicles, mm. Is, is not particularly safe for cyclists. Mm. So why is the white pavement not being used as shared use? Is this Portwell High Street? No, Nitri means 
Oh, Nutri Mains. Nutri Mains. It was a long Nutri Mains. But you're testing my memory so here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> about 30 years. No, I, I can't remember things that happened last year, never mind, 30 years ago. It basically uh, goes from sort of Cameron Tollish area up to yeah. sort of, you know, the sort of uh, Visp um, area. Adam. If Leslie McInnes was here, she'd probably know the answer because she, she probably cycles that way into work. Um, <laughs> Adam, do you want to take that? Yeah. yeah. Is that picking me up? No. If I go very close, there we go. Um, so I don't know the answer of when that changed, but I can certainly look into it. Um, one of the things that having a 10% um, budget allocation across our uh, revenue and uh, capital budget has allowed us to do is invest in, although we tend to focus the debate up around uh, the big splashy things that are multi-million pound projects, actually local roads managers have an ability to bid in for some of that uh, money for smaller scale projects. So if it's a case of signage, if it's a case of uh, marking a, an area, a space that's already um, capable of, of coping with the cycle lane, then it's far, uh, it's far cheaper. And actually if it's just uh, road markings, um, I think we can do that in, now I'm boring everyone, but I think we can do that in revenue rather than capital, which is far easier. Um, for a lot of projects, so I'm more than happy to look into the example, but I don't know when it um, when it would have changed. Okay, do we have um, a question on this side? Anyone from Portobello or Craig Miller or Joppa or Musselburgh on this side? <gasps> no, yeah. are you? Oh. <laughs> 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 but we'll take you anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll come over to you. Over to you next after this question here. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not ticking many diversity boxes, sorry. Um, uh, that's actually quite an interesting question because my question was related to uh, main routes into the city. Uh, I noticed in the talk, and the city centre transformation sounds amazing and it's really exciting, but I just noticed a tiny touch of complacency, if I may say, Adam, about the routes into town and people cycling into town. An example, if I may, uh, the Quality Street Junction is going to get dug up uh, next week. Uh, and there's a lit up on my local Facebook page about people saying, oh, I can't, I can't face driving out of town on the Quality Street thing, and I'm going to cycle. And I'm like, yes, amazing. <laughs> and I've had to spend ages explaining how they're going to cycle into town. And we still don't have a situation where we have decent, direct, easily navigable routes into town. Obviously, we've got the, the North Path terminates at Roseburn. Obviously, we've got a plan for that. But we could easily create on these vast arterial roads that we have that are, in a lot of cases, already down to single lane. Um, like Queen's Ferry Road from Craigleith into the West End. Gilmerton Road is horrific. It's like a, obviously like some sort of cratered um, <laughs> field. Um, that's a vastly wide road that's already down to a single lane uh, for general traffic. That could easily uh, have a, a cycle lane on its own. So I just wonder if along with all these plans that sound amazing and exciting, if there's parallel plans to create high quality, direct segregated lanes in the town. Could, so could we answer that for Glasgow and Edinburgh, I mm -hmm. think, would be useful, yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe ask uh, Dizzy to come in as well, but so I think what you're talking about is more, more capital expenditure in terms of major projects. But when you think about what we can do and what we've got the capacity to do, a 10% budget allocation over the next five years will be something like £15 million matched in by the Scottish Government's um, funding that they've given us for Community Links Plus. That'll probably give us an investment pot of something like 30, 35 um, million, I think, over the next um, four years, including uh, this year, so over, the, over that five-year period. We can't do everything um, within that time, but I think connecting, I mean, the the city centre link between George Street and Meadows is a prime example where we're connecting two um, really important, already established uh, routes, particularly when you think of the northern route that comes from Scotland Street to New Haven, for example. You start linking a, a whole holistic uh, number of routes into the city centre. So I'm, I'm first to say we've got much more to do. Um, I'd also say, cheekily, one of my uh, best experiences of roadworks recently was um, in the south side, because not having traffic on that street improved the feel of the, despite the pneumatic drills, um, actually improved the, the ambience of that uh, street no end. So there's a lot more to do, and there are 
I'm sure everyone would have a, a top three key routes that they would want to invest in. I think we've put in enough investment in place and built up our internal capacity enough with the help of people like uh, Daisy to make sure we can make a lot of change in the next five years. But I don't think anyone would say we'd be able to do anything within that time. So I hope it's, it gives a good foundation for growth. Yeah, yeah and uh, just very quickly, two points, I suppose. The city centre transformation project is exciting and amazing. But it, I'm quite clear that the boundary is, is a porous one. You know, it's a, it's a false boundary. It's the World Heritage Trust. It's just a line on a map. So one of the objectives, again, there were 15 of them. I didn't go through them. But the first one under FAIR is that the city centre transformation has to benefit surrounding communities. And part of that is the connectivity between Stockbridge and Gilmerton and, you know, the, the areas that surround that. So, yes, I mean, at some point that boundary will become hard because it will become a project. But until then, you know, the thinking has to be beyond that. So, you know, I need, I need answers and, you know, um, solutions from people who use routes like that. Very quickly, I don't want to steal Glasgow's thunder, but putting on my Sustrans hat, um, I remember the city, si the, the cycling strategy that we worked on together, Anna, and uh, which won the award last year this time, um, which they, it was such a great process. They did, um, I think it was two years, a year of auditing routes, and as part of that whole audit process, they came up with a package of small works, which was dropped curbs, removing chicanes, you know, little things, you know, share, where you can have shared paths and things that, um, you know, the lady brought up there. So that, and then also looking at the big arterial routes that come in. And I thought that was fabulous. Maybe something like that could be useful. I think Anna's much better qualified to address Glasgow issue than me. W would you like to, Anna? Or? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I've always got an opinion on cycling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in terms of the arterial routes, what we're doing in Glasgow is, thanks to Sustrans Community Links Plus, uh, we have got two projects underway and being delivered on Community Links Plus, um, in case you thought that Edinburgh had more than us, you don't. Um, <laughs> at the moment, the first CL Plus project we won was the South City Way. Uh, it's been described by a few people in the know that it's possibly the most significant piece of infrastructure for cycling outside London at the moment. So um, it's a really exciting segregated route. Uh, and it's uh, a model that we're going to replicate. So we've gone on the most direct route we can through a big major high street. Um, it's fully segregated. It's really wide. It's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, <laughs> I've, I've said at a few meetings, you can tell when I've had a bad day because I tweet a picture of South City Way and everybody retweets and I feel happy again. So yeah, it's a hugely important project. And I think that gives uh, a sense of the, the size of our ambition and, uh, and how... Uh, how important those, those uh, commuter routes are going to be uh, and certainly uh, there will be plenty more of those being planned and designed at the moment in the pipeline. Some are being put in for funding already uh, and what's really important to us is com uh, connecting communities that don't have um, connectivity just now. David was talking about uh, transport poverty and, and inclusion. Um, it's not enough to connect our West Ends or our nice suburbs. It's really important to connect those communities that have been cut off for so long that really, really need those options for, for travelling more safely. So that's something that's really important. But one other thing, if I may make one more point while I'm here, one, one uh, and then I'll give the mic back, um, is that commuter routes are really, really important. They absolutely are. I use one every single day, but they're not the whole solution. Commuter routes suit men more than they suit women. They don't suit um, female travel patterns as well as they do men's. So we cannot get hung up on commuter routes alone. Uh, that's why our second Community Links Plus project is an area-based mini Holland style project because we have to be building for all of our communities and all of our people, not just the men doing the nine to five. The, the, was the um, gentleman there in the front row? Yeah. Just, I, I, I asked about Portobello because we've got a little bit of a Portobello contingent, but included Craig Miller and the wider area. Yeah, it's yeah. Craig Miller, really. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's good that the first questioner raised Craig Miller because it is developing very quickly. All the, all the empty spaces in Craig Miller are being filled with housing. A lot of it mm. is, is really quite good quality housing. There's also a new school being built in, in Craig Miller. There's a lot of potential to get children cycling to school using the, the double, double width pavement that the first, the first question talked about, because it also connects in with the, the cycle route off into to Roslyn. It, it, it's all, it, it can all be joined up. 
Um, I also think all that development in Craig Miller is going to put even more pressure on the innocent cycle route, which is starting to get very busy in summer because it's such a logical shortcut into the city centre yes. for anybody in, in that area. So there's going to be more people walking on that and there's going to be more people cycling on that. So um, it's starting to struggle a bit. Mm -hmm. So is, is your question, what, what's the, the strategic approach to that area? Yeah. I suppose so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I might just add in that um, I know I'm not supposed to, um, but I cycle up to the Royal Infirmary through Craig Miller quite often, and there's a missing sign, um, <laughs> and which means that I know Craig Miller very well indeed, and have not quite made it to the hospital following the signs. <laughs> so you can pick that up as well. It's on Twitter if you want some information. Okay. Thank you. For, uh, we're, we're always reliant on people reporting issues, so um, we'll do our best. Um, and I've, I mean, I've cycled that route from, uh, from Leith, actually, all the way to Rosalind, and it is a fantastic route for anyone that's not, uh, that's not done it, but you do feel um, a missed sign can send you on a, a wild goose chase, um, considering the uh, housing estates and things that you're sort of meandering around, but it is a fantastic place to go. Um, in response to direct question, I actually think we might be making some of it worse, um, but in a good way, because the, some of the lighting upgrades that we're doing along that path, and in particular with Innocent Railway um, Tunnel and things like that, will mean more people are going to use it. Now, that's good congestion rather than bad congestion, um, because there's not that much uh, you can do in terms of the, the width of the uh, tunnel and things like that um, but I would far rather have cyclists queuing to get uh, anywhere frankly um, or pedestrians or having that shared space and having to look at the problem and it's a great problem to have when you have active travel uh, competing with each other and how you square that circle and better improve the environment for both those uses. I'd far rather have that conversation and that problem on our desk as a council than um, congestion which will make an air quality worse and, and other things. So actually we're going to be making it worse, but we're going to be making it worse by improving the environment and making it a much more attractive option. So I think there's a question right down the back in the corner. Yeah. Hi. Um, I live on the uh, quality bike corridor, uh, <laughs> which runs from King's Buildings to the University in George Square. And we were really excited when we heard about the Quality Bike Corridor, but the Quality Bike Corridor is a really dangerous place to cycle. And I've organised several cycle rides to school with Sheen's Primary School. And we cycle en masse, and we have to cycle en masse. Otherwise, um, the children in danger of being knocked down by the speeding cars. Now, we were really, really excited about the 20 mile an hour. However, as a car driver, as a pedestrian, and as a cyclist, I rarely see drivers driving at 20 miles an hour. What can we do about this? What can be done about the speeding drivers? Because it makes such a difference as a cyclist, as a car driver, and as a pedestrian, if everybody slows down to 20 miles an hour. We need it policed, please. Right. Okay. So, can we have? Um, I think Adam, can you answer that? But I'd inter yeah. be interested in David's perspective on that as well. Yeah, yeah, I can. So, this might be a surprise to some people, but the police have stopped hundreds of people already in the city. They've issued warnings. They've uh, even booked a couple of people, and they got nice fines. Um, enforcement will only take you so far, and I would encourage. Um, the question on every single person in the room to keep saying that message, keep saying it to the people that you know, the people that live in this city, because it's not about police enforcement. And on, on police enforcement, we have a contract with Police Scotland. We pay them £2.6 million and we set the priorities uh, for a whole heap of officers and what they do in our communities for that money. And one of the things we wrote into it when we implemented the 20 million hour limit was enforcement of that limit in the city 
And to be fair to the police, they have enforced it as much as they would enforce 30 miles an hour or anything else. But enforcement will only get us so far. A driver who um, is mouthing off saying that they hate 20 miles an hour to everyone who will listen and everyone responds with, yes, it's terrible, isn't it? Big bad council making us drive at 20 miles an hour. Um, that validates that behaviour. And actually, culturally, we need to stop doing that. We need a different ethos. And there's a decent critical mass. This city is quite small, really, when you think of it. There's a critical mass of people even in this room that telling that message of enforcement to your friends, your neighbours, I mean, don't be like biblical about it, but, um, but your friends, your neighbours, your, everyone you know, trying to get that message over is going to be exponentially more successful than anything we can do to get police out with speed guns. Now, police are out with speed guns, so if you need that little um, stick in the conversation uh, with the people who are yet to be convinced, feel free to use it because they are out there. Um, and you know we pay for them to be out there and they do pick random locations and they do enforce. But that's not what's going to change behaviour in the city. What's going to change behaviour in the city is people understanding that eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds want to cycle to school, want to cycle to the shops with our parents, want to engage with the city space on equal terms, that will have far, far more impact than anything we can do as a council or the police to force people um, to stick to 20 miles an hour. I should point out as well, from the information we're getting, speed limits, I, I agree, um, sometimes they're not at 20 miles an hour, but average speeds have fallen in the city. So the message and the impact is having an effect. It's not having the full effect. And to get there, we're going to need culture change. And that's what I think everyone in this room and everyone in the city should get behind. David, do you want to comment on the, the sort of broader issue around culture change and maybe in the context of the transformation work in, in Glasgow? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's one area where Edinburgh has done really well is on 20 mile per hour speed limits. But if they're not being enforced, then they're much less effective. When I was around here, we, we went for physical interventions and an awful lot of speed bumps, which were very contentious, but we, we, couldn't, we couldn't rely on the police enforcing speed limits in 20 miles on, especially around all the schools. And we took the view that even though there'd be a lot of opposition from drivers, it was much more important to try and make children safe in and around schools. Um, the, the solution here, and it's probably further off than we'd like, are autonomous vehicles. And I've been trying to encourage everyone from the Department for Transport to Transport for London to start to prepare now for autonomous vehicles. And one of the key issues here, and this is important for road safety, is the driver should not have control over the speed of his or her vehicle. That should be left to the roads authority. The roads authority will be able to enforce every single speed limit because the roads authority will be in control of that speed. Now, car manufacturers will hate it, and the Jeremy Clarksons of this world will hate it, but you can, you can reduce fatalities by 90% by doing that. But we have to start campaigning that now because I'm really concerned that we're not getting ahead of the game here in terms of preparing the way for autonomous vehicles that work in the best interests of everyone. Um, and what needs to be done on it. Okay. Um, Chaz, you were right at the beginning. Do you have a question about transformation? Because I want to move the subject to that, if we can. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chaz Booth, Green Councillor for Leith. Um, so my question is not about cycling, but it is related to the transformation project, and perhaps cycling will be part of the answers. Uh, David mentioned that we have the best bus company in the UK um, in Edinburgh, and I completely agree with that, and our bus patronage is going up in contrast to Glasgow's going down. But I don't think we should be complacent about that. Lothian buses aren't complacent. Lothian buses say that the number one threat to their profitability, to their usership, to their punctuality is congestion. So my question to the panel would be, what can the city centre transformation project do to tackle congestion and to ensure that our buses remain reliable and remain really well used? Can I, can I do that? Charles, so, thanks for prompting me on this question because, you know, what disappoints me most about what I've seen in Edinburgh 20-odd um, years since we put in Greenways, 
they don't even have a lick of paint now. You can't see the greenways. There's been no extension to greenways. Um, and, and bus speeds, bus speeds in Edinburgh, they're, they're declining, not as fast as bus speeds in Glasgow, but the search I did for greener journeys showed that bus speeds in Edinburgh are declining by about 0.8% every year. So that's about 45% every decade. That matters hugely. And here's the thing, if you, if you go back, and I'm, I'm prompting you here to take action on this, Charles, because I, I know that you're on the right side of this debate. This is the best investment the city council can make is to improve bus speeds. Why? Because if you get a 10% improvement in bus speeds, Lothian buses get 10% more passengers and the council gets much more dividend, which they can reinvest. So just like Dave Defoe came to me and said, we want, seems a, pit, a pittance now, but 2% of our capital budget to go on transport, you should go back to the council and suggest that a proportion of Lothian buses' dividend is ring-fenced to maintain and enforce greenways, and they'll get the money back, money back 10 times. Um, yeah. Do you mind if I yeah, just... Yeah, no, I'd like you to answer. Or, yeah. uh, I, do you know, exactly, and as I said, the bus company is crucial to the success of the transformation project. Lothian buses have to be part of it. So right from the outset, I've said that, and... So, so glad that we now have somebody from Lothian Buses on the team, on the project team, uh, Ben Ritchie, who is, who's been there for 20 years, who understands the bus network, the bus, like the back of his hand, he used to be a drive, bus driver. He's brilliant, and yesterday was his first day, official day in the team. We had a fire alarm in here to walk out of the council, but apart from that, it was a proper start, trial by fire for him. But it's, it's amazing, the fact that, you know, when I spoke to Lothian Buses, they have a 2020, plan and I said why don't we work together on this because when uh, you know we'll challenge each other there'll be times when you don't agree when you know, we don't agree with what we needs done there's 5,600 bus trips on Princess Street a day and even Lothian buses say that's not sustainable that's not good for the city uh, so we're talking about things like maybe electric hopper buses in the city center potentially the ideas that we're having with Lothian buses now rather than as a key stakeholder, you know, a year down the line. And I think that's really encouraging. Adam, do you want to say anything or? Well, <laughs> I'm almost tempted to respond to this. Oh, go um, on. Yeah. Just because, I mean, in Edinburgh, enforcement of, of bus lanes doesn't seem to be the predominant um, problem, despite their lack of, of paint. Actually, culturally, the city is relatively well behaved in terms of going in. Um, and you'll have to look at the number of uh, fines that the city um, issue every year for people going in and out. So that is being enforced. Um, so, I'm, I'm more, so I'm more than happy to find out tomorrow exactly how many fines we've uh, collected as a result of people going in the in the Greenway. So stay tuned to my Twitter account tomorrow and find out the answer Adam, to that result. Adam, can I, can I make a suggestion? Because, um, let me get this thing right. Um, set, set targets on bus speed. Right, the, now Leeds have started to do it. Leeds have set a target to double bus patronage in a decade. We probably won't do it, but it's ambitious and I'd rather it was ambitious. As the Highways Authority, they have said that we are going to set a target to improve bus speeds. Now, the first target in Edinburgh will be to stop bus journey times increasing. Because every year they're increasing. Yep. Now, that, and, and Lothian buses will tell you they're absolutely right, that is the number one threat to the, to the Edinburgh success story on buses, is slower and slower buses. What would also help enormously in Edinburgh, which, the, which they actually have in Glasgow, is contactless. Mm. And contactless payment for visitors in particular yeah. would be, is that coming? Yeah. But I would, I would, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping people are... are, are That's a way to buy a ticket, I, by the I way. Would, I would, not, I, not who you sit beside. <laughs> ask, ask the highways department, whatever they're called now, what would they have to do to stop bus speeds falling? What interventions would it take? If it's enforcement of that, yeah. is it engineering measures? Is it more pain? What do you need to do? Because trust me, putting greenways in was a huge huge task at the time and it was massively controversial and there was a huge boost to bus patronage in Edinburgh yep. as a result and I'd hate to see that legacy 
fritter away because of a lack of priority given to buses in Edinburgh. Okay. You've just, got 30 just, more seconds. Okay, yeah. just, just respond, well actually just to build on it rather than to respond on it because I agree with the point, but it's not just a point for Lothian buses, that when you look at the regional bus, um, bus uh, services that have actually undergone change and negative change, cancelling reduced routes as a result of congestion in the city and what they're saying is a 10% increase in journey times and 8% reduction in profit and they're becoming unviable. That's given us a regional dimension. Daisley already pointed out 65,000 people are driving into our city centre every day. The regional element to this is hugely important and it's a, an element that we don't have as much control over. We, we have less control over the number of people coming from Fife because we um, don't have control over uh, the, the bus company, etc., to, to do those services in a different way. So the regional dimension is hugely important. The task force that's been set up already with Lothian Buses and other operators and the council to look at congestion and improving bus times has delivered an action plan which has been uh, delivered upon. So it's not like the council's ignoring it. But I absolutely agree with the point being made. Unless we improve journey times, not just in the city, but in the region, that 65,000 number is going to keep going up and the number of people looking at uh, bus within the city as a viable option is going to go down. Thankfully, it hasn't yet, but it's going to reach a critical mass. Okay, so there's a very patient uh, woman just in uh, there. You know who you are. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd like to follow up the uh, question about buses on Princess Street. Uh, people, we all know, and you, you mentioned it, it's like a bus station. So it seemed to me... There is a real conflict there. You know, we need to increase the speed of buses and we need to get lots of people on buses into the city centre. The last time I asked somebody about this from the active travel team, they actually told me that one, there was two answers. Uh, you know, my question was, can we divert some of these buses away from Princess Street? Nobody wants to walk in between all these buses, never mind cycle. And the answer was twofold. One is that we don't have control over what the buses company do because they need to make a profit and they're privatized and all that kind of thing. And the other answer was that um, we can't justify having these few cyclists replacing all these buses. And, and the statistics just don't bear out. Could people comment on that? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, that's, I come back to the point that we now have someone from Lothian Buses on the team, and that's exactly why it's so critical to have someone there as part of that conversation from the beginning. So things like re rerouting of buses, you know, the council can't have that conversation without, without Lothian Buses being part of that. So that's, that's really, really um, positive. Uh, in terms of, I mean, I, I go back to data, and that's why data is so important. You know, all these buses going through, where are they going? How many people are they carrying? They have this incredible um, app that, you know, that they have all that data. And we've talked about, you know, how we can share that data, make use of, you know, understand what those trips are about. And, you know, do we really need all those through routes? And could we rationalize some of those through routes so they can then be used where bus, other bus, um, you know, there's, there's not as many bus services available. Uh, you know, there are quite a few double-decker buses, so, so things like that, you know, that, can you have smaller buses, electric buses that are quieter? So all those conversations are now on the table, which, you know, I can understand why the active travel team said that, because, you know, it's not within their, their remit to, to uh, you know, divert a bus route. But now that we have someone with Lodium buses there, hopefully we can do that together. Uh, ooh, we've only got time for about two more questions, so while I'm just deciding who the lucky people are going to be, um, I'm just a quick warning for the panel that I'm going to ask you to do a two-minute each sum up of what you've learnt from the audience's questions that you're going to take away and have a think about that's new for you or different. Um, whom is most deserving? <laughs> So I think we'll go for you in the blue T-shirt. Oh, Naz. You, Naz, I have to pick my friend. Naz, Naz first. Naz first, and then you in the blue. If you can. I think I take all your diversity boxes. I'm Turkish. <laughs> With glasses, I'm Muslim. Not practicing one anyway. Um, and I'm a lady woman. Um, so there you go. Um, I congratulate. Daisy uh, taking this huge challenge forward. I left the council last March, and I, when I heard 
that Daisy is coming for this project, my heart sunk because I really wanted to work with her to actually <laughs> do this happen. <laughs> and I, I, I envy you. I envy you and I don't envy your challenge. But um, I wish you all the best. Transformation is a big word. And it's a big challenge. But sometimes the transformation comes actually from small things. And uh, my project, when I left, and I still kind of carry on in my heart, in my head, and also as part of my work at Napier University, um, the, it was the Edinburgh Design Guidance, Street Design Guidance. And what it's trying to achieve is that those small changes that brings into play makes the place inclusive. That, you know, you said one of your objectives was to make the city, or the vision was make the city inclusive. And I want to congratulate Glasgow for actually putting a huge budget into making their city is the accessible city, accessible Glasgow project. And I would like to see that, you know, part of that transformation is actually going into that kind of small efforts that actually transform the city centre into a much more pleasant place. And those could be drop curbs. I would, I would love, I, I mean, I would hate to see as a result of this five years effort or whatever the action plan that you're going to come up with, not to see a single non-dropped curb. <laughs> No blister um, payment, tactile payment at the crossings, right, no, and uh, lots have, more of the continuous footways <laughs> in the city centre, especially, and I'll pass it on to you because I don't want to take more time. And pass, just, and pass it directly on to if you hold, hold your answers and you can have your question now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mine's uh, much shorter than that. <laughs> 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 it comes back to actually some of the crowd noise earlier that related to greenways. Uh, it really, really upset me whenever there was a consultation and it went in favour of the car drivers uh, that people can drive in greenways outside peak times. Um, I live uh, uh, just off Calder Road and I cycle right in the middle of the greenway there whenever I'm using it uh, because I, uh, people drive fast along there and a lot of people in Edinburgh uh, avoid the greenways at any time, all the time. It's so great. So your question is? My question is, when's that <laughs> going to uh, when's that going to change? When are we going to have our uh, greenways back? <laughs> so so um, very quickly, we have got small things for big That's change. Yeah. So a very quick, very quick response. Right. And um, when are we having the greenways back, I Adam? Right. And then we can go into the um, the summaries. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Naz. And I don't know if you know this, but I'm going to poach you from Napier, and you're coming back to the council. I don't think anyone's told you that before, <laughs> but that's going to happen. Um, but yes, I couldn't agree with you more, all the points you made. Uh, the action plan that I'm going to go over to the council next year, in my head at the moment, is it's going to be a one-year, three-year, five-year, ten-year action plan, then looking to 2050. And exactly within that one year is those small transformative changes. What does transformation mean? You know, it means big. You, you can open... Um, one of my bonkers dreams is to open Scotland Street Tunnel, so you can go straight to Waverley Station through St Andrews Bus, all of that. But you could... <laughs> you don't think I'm bonkers, I love this room. <laughs> the council think I'm bonkers when I say that. And, um, but then, you know, a, a package of works, like I mentioned Glasgow did, drop curbs, you know, I've talked to Henry about uh, chicanes <laughs> for a long time, and that's the kind of thing that we need to, to sort out as well. That's transformative. Any final comment on the greenways that's new? That about that's new. That about getting them back, or so. <laughs> uh -huh. In one bullet, in one bullet point. In one bullet point. <laughs> in one bullet point, everything is up for review. Um, when we made the change, it was not just about changing the access out with peak times. It was also about giving access to other vulnerable road users, um, like people on mopeds, etc. So there were changes made. There was an analysis done after a period um, of time, and we thought the impact was not having uh, a serious detrimental effect. Now, the hierarchy of street design remains the same in Edinburgh. Pedestrian is first, other vulnerable road users, cyclists, etc., uh, are next. 
Public transport is very clearly after that, and car is at the bottom, and it's always at the bottom. It's at the bottom for the work Daisy's doing in the city centre transformation. It's at the bottom for everything that we're doing in terms of designing Leith Walk for, for, for a potential uh, tram or anywhere else in the city. In terms of the exact specific decision, it's under review just like all our policies are. And if it's evidence that's causing a major issue that cycling numbers are in decline in key parts uh, as a result of it, then we'll look at it again. We'll either look at it again in terms of changing the uh, peak time or off time um, rules governing it, or we'll look at it in terms of the other alternative infrastructure that we can build, which is the other solution that um, we need to drive forward. Because I'm aware that while I'm very comfortable cycling alongside a, a massive Lothian bus, and I think the bus drivers are incredibly courteous in Edinburgh, they're very, very well trained, a lot of people aren't, and a lot of young people aren't, a lot of women have said they're not. Um, now, that's absolutely fine. So we sh in my view, we shouldn't be treating greenways as cycleways because that's exclusive in its, in its definition. It'll be fine for people like me, and I'll be That's a happy really to long bullet point. It is. So, it is, but yeah. notice, <laughs> notice there was no full you, stop. You've so gone into went, the next um, slide. But more than happy to, to keep uh, re-looking at policies like this. But we shouldn't treat greenways as cycleways because they're not. And for a lot of cyclists, they will never be that. Right. So um, what? So we're almost out of time now. We've just got a few minutes left. So what um, we've asked the speakers to do, and we'll start with David, is um, give a couple of minutes summing up and what, what you've heard and what you'd like to reflect on in terms of going forward in Glasgow, David. I mean, firstly, what I've heard that I mean, Edinburgh's in, in good hands. Um, I share some of the concerns about greenways and the change to the timings in greenways. But my general impression tonight is that with Adam and Daisy, the city's in, in really good hands. The other thing I want to pick up tonight from what people have been saying is that sometimes it's the very small interventions which make the biggest difference. And I look back to what we did 25 years ago. It was advanced stop lines for cyclists. Mm -hmm. And that was because... So, you know, so many cyclists were, 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 were getting caught up behind in front of lorries and being intimidated by, by vehicles. So advanced stop lines made a huge difference. And the other intervention, which never got much attention, is putting zebra crossings back in George Street. Because zebra crossings were taken out by, by highways planners in the 1960s because they slowed up traffic. And when I asked for them to go back, the highways engineers at Lothian Region said, but they would just slow up cars. And I said, so what? Put them in and actually revitalize the north side of George Street because people couldn't cross George Street. Mm -hmm. Something I know we need to look at for Glasgow actually bringing back zebra crossing. Yeah. yeah, well done. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy? Yeah. Yeah, that's been such, a, such an interesting evening. Thank you. What have I learned? I think, um, I don't know about learning, but I think more reflection on leadership. Uh, leadership both top down, um, Adam and David and you know, all the, the things we've talked about. Um, and also bottom up, you know, the, this room, you're, you're all full of, you know, you're passionate, enthusiastic, and you're all leaders, and you're making, making change happen. Um, very quickly, over the past few weeks, I think I've heard a lot of, but we've heard this before, and what's new this time, and oh, this isn't going to happen. You know, a lot of cynicism is out there, um, both within the council, because, you know, they've had so many years of, all of that beating down on them. But I'm sure because of you know, things that I've heard today, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going back to my job tomorrow feeling inspired and enthusiastic that I have this support um, behind me. So, thank you. Adam. Um, I suppose one thing I'd, I'd communicate and I'd also reflect in my own thinking is that the 10% um, allocation of our transport budget for cycling is a target, but it's not a limit. The small things that can be done on Nidra Mains Road and others to improve signage, advanced stop lines, um, whether it's advanced uh, cycling signals, which we have in Leith Walk, um, the first time in the city that we've used it, and it works very, very well, I have to say, someone who's cycled it a lot, that there are other budgets and other means of achieving things that are not necessarily um, within the baseline of what we've established 
in the city. And we probably have to do a better job in finding a way of canvassing um, those small, cheap, but effective solutions that can better improve our infrastructure and encourage more people to engage in active travel because it's going to keep us all living longer, living healthier. It's going to improve our air quality and make our city a much more livable place. So that's the kind of action point. I like to leave things with an action point. So in my own head, my action point is to find a better way of us uh, as a council canvassing opinion in people who are using these routes day in, day out. Um, I, I always end things like this by saying, if you do have examples like this, feel free to email me. I know I'm going to regret saying that, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, do feel free to email me because um, the more information we have, the better our... And email Daisy. Email Daisy! Uh, no. <laughs> um, because the more information we have, uh, the better our infrastructure can be. Thank you. And can I just say that you, as always, the people who come to Spokes public meetings make, make the event so fantastic. It's definitely the best public meeting in Edinburgh. Um, the questions are always brilliant um, and they're always sharp and well thought through and challenging. So thank you so much. It's you that's made the meeting and thank you very much to our panel members. And Dave, do you want to say anything else or have you said enough? And, um, and if, you want, if anyone wants to hang back briefly, there's usually quite a good chat at the end. So thank you very much for coming. Hi. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to say something before you all disappear off. Uh, first of all, thanks to Kirsty for the evening, and thanks to all of you for your interesting questions. We, we do have uh, another spokes event, which is on Monday evening, don't forget, uh, downstairs here, where we're talking about 40 years of campaigning uh, as spokes and looking forward to the next 10 years, um, what we might expect to see during that time. Um, we have been live streaming um, this evening on YouTube, and hopefully the video will be available uh, to, to watch. Oh, it's available immediately. Uh, when you get back home, so if there's something that you missed or didn't quite catch, or you want to write down what Adam actually said, uh, then it's on YouTube. If you just look for Spokes Videos, you will find it on there. Thanks very much, everybody.